May the Lord's name be glorified as we sit in his presence. Once again, it is our privilege to be together as God's people and to, after having, remembering, after having remembered the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to look into his word. We are uh, in chapter 40 of Isaiah. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we started our survey of the book of Isaiah by looking at chapter 6. And now we do a big jump uh, to chapter 40. And chapter 40 begins a section of Isaiah that is sometimes considered as uh, the second book of Isaiah uh, because it marks a shift in the timeline that Isaiah prophesies about. And it's also the portion of the book that contains the very familiar passages about the Messiah, what we call the servant songs, chapter 42, 49, 50, 52, and 53. But this portion begins with uh, chapter 40, with this very famous passage. Um, even people who are not Christians know Isaiah chapter 40. Anyone knows why that is? At least in the Western world, that's a clue. Isaiah chapter 40 is very famous, especially around Christmas. No, no one knows? Okay. Um, so there's this very famous uh, opera called Handel's Messiah that people go to uh, during Christmas time, especially. And Handel's Messiah begins with Isaiah chapter 40. There's a very famous song called Comfort Ye My People. Then there's Every Valley Shall Be Lifted Up. And then the word of the Lord um, you know, the glory of the Lord shall be seen. And so many people actually, you know, learn Handel's Messiah in music school and things like that. So they know the verses. And it comes from Isaiah chapter 40. And it's a very famous passage. It begins, comfort, comfort my people. But why is Isaiah proclaiming a message of comfort? You know, Bible um, study is actually pretty easy. But we make it very difficult sometimes. Because Isaiah chapter 40 comes after Isaiah chapter 39. So if you read Isaiah chapter 39, then go to Isaiah chapter 40, you will understand why there is a message of comfort. You know, often we just uh, want to find the verses that we like or that will give us comfort, and we go straight there, and then we have no clue what the context is. So what's happening here is that in the beginning of Isaiah, the threat to the nation of Judah came from this country or the empire called as the Assyrian <coughs> Empire. But God promised the kings of Judah that he would protect them. And indeed, that threat uh, was nullified. It came to pass with no danger to the nation of Judah. By the sovereignty of God, they were, the weaker nation was able to withstand this very strong empire. But you know, as is often the question in the word of God, would that be enough for the people of God to continue in faith? That God has rescued them, would faith continue? So what happens in chapter 39 is King Hezekiah, he invites an envoy from the Babylonian empire, at that point the preeminent uh, empire and power in the region, and if you read chapter 39, it says that he invites the, uh, the, the envoy of Babylon and he shows them, shows that person everything there is to show in Jerusalem, including the temple of God, all the treasures, uh, you know, all of the secrets, you could say, that were supposed to be guarded. And why did Hezekiah do that? He wanted the comfort of an alliance with Babylon, with a pagan nation. He wanted the security that would come from having a political alliance with this very strong power because he thought, oh, that would protect us from any external threat. And so having been protected by God from Assyria, the nation of Judah goes and seeks an alliance with Babylon. And that's why Isaiah prophesies, it's a very short chapter, chapter 39, he goes to Hezekiah and says, because you have done this, because you have disregarded God, God who protected you, 
you disregarded him and instead you have now sought an alliance with uh, the pagan empire of Babylon. You see in verse 5 and 6 of chapter 39, it says, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, everything that is showed to the envoy, and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So this is the reason why they are now will be taken into exile in Babylon because of their posture of unbelief in God who has protected them from every danger, they will now be taken into exile in Babylon. So what does Hezekiah do? Hezekiah, it's a kind of like a funny kind of verse. Verse 8 of chapter 9, and then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. Oh, very nice, right? Like he's a very holy man. For he thought there will be peace and security in my days. That is because it is a prophecy that is going to happen in the future, he said, it will not affect me. It's a comfort for me, but not for thee, right? So that is the reason why there is now the message of comfort. It is to this future people in exile. Okay? Isaiah is now prophesying to the people who are going to be in exile in Babylon that comfort will come from God himself. They will be recipients of God's judgment for their lack of faith. They will be in a foreign land away from their homeland. And they will wonder if this exile is the end of their status as God's uh, people, as a nation that belongs to God. But to those people, after having prophesied the judgment of God, Isaiah prophesies a message of comfort. It is a song about God's comfort, a promise of restoration, and of help in their time of trouble. It is also, as we saw in chapter 6, it is also a template for the gospel. Just like Isaiah chapter 6, which talked about the holiness of God, gave us the template for the gospel with regards to God's judgment and mercy and atonement. Here we see how God's comfort works. And that's also how the comfort in the gospel works. You know, the God of all comfort is a common phrase. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. How does that comfort work? That is how Isaiah chapter, that is what Isaiah chapter 40 uh, talks about. And that is also a template for how all comfort from God works, especially the comfort of the gospel. And so as we go through this passage, uh, there are three things we can pay our attention to. This passage talks about the promise of comfort. Then it gives us a guarantee of comfort. And lastly, it tells us the perspective with which we have to view God's comfort. So the promise of comfort that comes from God, the guarantee that God will indeed accomplish his promise, and then how do we view um, God's comfort. How do we take advantage of that? That is perspective. So when we talk of uh, the promise, you see in chapter 40, uh, it begins with mercy from God. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And as we saw last time, anytime there's a couple of words that are repeated, it is emphasizing the fact that this is the main message. So the message is one of comfort. And in verse 2, it says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So God is saying, even though you acted in unbelief towards me, I will speak tenderly to you as if, uh, I will speak tenderly as to a loved one. You know, tenderness uh, is a sign of intimacy. And what is the message? That is, her judgment or her exile will be ended. That is, her warfare will be ended because her sins have been pardoned. So God has 
taken the initiative uh, to pardon the sins of the people of Judah. And it is not for uh, you know, want of suffering. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, this, path, this verse makes it seem like, oh, you know, she, uh, Judah should have been punished once, but God was so angry that uh, he punished uh, Judah again. That's not what it actually in intends to say. It just means that uh, Judah has completed uh, the course of judgment that was ordained for her. So there was a period of exile that was ordained for her, and she has completed that period in full. So it is talking about completeness or fullness. So God accepts that the term of her suffering has been entered. It has been fully completed. And when that term of suffering ends, there will be comfort that comes from God. There's a promise of comfort. And to reinforce that, there are three voices of comfort in this promise. And there are three uh, unique voices in the passage that we read. There's a voice that cries, and then there's another voice and a third voice. And each of these voices proclaims a particular theme. And the first voice is in verse 3 to 5. It says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. spoken. So the first voice is, uh, you know, the first message of comfort is that the Lord is coming. That is the first message of comfort. You know, we, our brother was reading from uh, Luke chapter 1. That is the same message, that the, the Lord is coming. And this, uh, you know, passage metaphorically refers to the time when uh, the children of Israel had just come out from Egypt and they saw God coming from Mount Sinai towards them uh, to, to, to meet them. And so that's why it talks about God coming from the mountain. And what this passage says is that when the Lord is coming, no obstruction, no obstacle stand, st shall stand before him. No mountain, no valley shall stand in his way. Right? It's like, uh, uh, you know, make straight the highway of the Lord. That is like, imagine, you know, and this, is, this takes a lot of imagination. Imagine there's no traffic on the 401. You go straight from Toronto all the way to the U.S. border. Nothing can stop you. That's what, the, the promise is that the Lord is coming. That is the first message of comfort. And we know that message is fulfilled by John the Baptist in John John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 23. He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. So for us, the Lord has come. And then he also gives us another message of comfort that he will come back again. So the first message of comfort is that the Lord is coming. And moreover, his coming will be for the benefit of all flesh in verse 5. His glory will be revealed to both Jew and Gentile. And it is a sure thing because it is God who promises it. So take comfort in the fact that the Lord is coming to rescue his people. The second voice of comfort is in verse 6 to 8. It says, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the, far, uh, the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Okay, that's a very weird, uh, comforting message. If I told you that, uh, I don't know if you would be that comforted. But look at what it is saying, right? What it's saying is that, where will you put your trust in? And this is especially relevant because of what has happened with Hezekiah. Where will you put your trust in? In the world and its people, its rulers and princesses and princes? Maybe your own friends and family. You know, verse 5 says, All flesh shall see the glory of God. That is God's mercy. But then immediately it says, But all flesh is like 
grass. Their beauty fades. You know, the word for beauty is the word hesed, which as we know is uh, typically translated as covenant love or uh, trustworthiness, dependability. So when it talks of the beauty of the flower, it's talking about the dependability of the flower, right? That's the purpose of the flower. The purpose of the flower is to, is to portray its beauty, but the flower fades. So can you truly depend on someone who is here today, gone tomorrow? It is the breath of Lord of God that gives life to all things, but he's sovereign in that his breath can also separate them from life. And just like that, they are gone. So where will you put your trust in? In the flowers and grass of this world or in the one who endures? It is the Lord who endures. His reality is not dependent on time or on factors outside his control. So will you put your trust in princes? No, but in the word of the Lord, which stands forever. It is dependable. So the second message of comfort is that not only is the Lord coming, but the Lord is dependable. He is trustworthy. And that is, you know, for a people in exile, that is a message of comfort. That is, you do not have to fear the strong people of the world. You do not have to beg for your dependence uh, on men and women. And you do not have to find your identity in your obligations and, and how you are perceived or received by other people. Like they may take your life, but it is the breath of God that ultimately gives and takes life. It is not in their control. And so I take comfort in the fact that I do not have to depend on others or myself or anyone else, but on God who is ultimately the only one who is truly worth depending on. The last message of comfort is in verse 9 to 11. It says, go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up and fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So you see a continuation of the message about the abilities of God. He is a strong man who overcomes all the strong men and warriors of this world. And he gives judgment or he enacts judgment on those who are opposed to him. But he brings rewards for those who belong to him. But also notice that to those who belong to him, his disposition, the way he interacts with them is not like the warrior, but like a shepherd. He tends to them and he cares for them with gentleness and tenderness. So he's not the warrior to his people. He is the shepherd to his people, but he is the warrior to those who are opposed to him. But you, you take comfort, you know, we took comfort in the fact that the Lord is coming, take comfort in the fact that the Lord is dependable. This message of comfort is not just in what uh, God will do, but in what the Lord calls us to do or calls his people to do. What, do, what does he call his people to do? He says in verse 9, go on up to a high mountain or Zion, herald of good news, and lift up your voice with strength and say to the cities of Judah, behold, your God. He calls his people to participate in his mission, to proclaim the good news. And the proclamation is, behold, see, this is your God, and this is our God. So our comfort, the third message of comfort, is that we are not only called to be recipients of God's grace, but to be part of his work, but to be part of his victory. That is, we are not only given the comfort of security, but also the comfort of purpose and mission. Right? True comfort has to cover all aspects of our life. If you are just a recipient of benefits, you are always going to think that at some point, the benefits are going to stop. 
if the winds of change come around, right? I might be depending on someone for benefits, but now it's going to stop. But what if they told you, you are actually going to be part of my plans and purposes. You have a role to play. That gives you an added degree of comfort. And that is what this third voice is saying. That is the comfort of the gospel. That is the comfort of the Great Commission, that God has a plan and purpose for us in his victorious mission. Even as he progresses towards ultimate vision to the nation of Judah and by extension to all of us. That is, the Lord is coming. For us, the Lord has come already. He'll come again. We look forward to a sure coming. He is dependable. We put our trust not in horses or chariots, but in the Lord. And then lastly, we are called to go out and proclaim his grace and gospel and to be part of the mission. You know, Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, having understood what God's comfort means, he says, for now am I seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Who do we depend on? On the Lord who has come, who is coming, on the Lord who is ultimately the only one who is dependable and the one who calls us to participate in his mission. So that's the promise of comfort. Then the second portion of this chapter from verse 12 to 26 gives us the guarantee of comfort. First portion deals with the question, does God have the desire to give comfort to his people? And the answer is yes. The second portion part deals with the question, but will he do so? Yes, he has the desire, but will he do so? And if so, does he have the ability to do so? Because it's common for human beings, as we know, uh, especially human beings in authority, to have the ability to do something but have no desire to do so. That's what politics is, right? And sometimes it's the reverse. They have the desire to do something, but they have no ability to help you. So both are needed in order for comfort to be affected. We need to have the desire, or someone needs to have the desire, and they also need to have the ability to help you. So Isaiah reflects on God's almighty power and strength in these verses that far surpasses any other in the universe. He is in a category of one. Nothing he puts his mind to will not be done. If he desires something, he is more than able to do it. And to prove that in two separate sections, uh, verses 12 to 20, and then later on in 21 to 26, he talks about God's sovereignty over three realms, over three domains. So just as there were three uh, messages of comfort, there are also three messages about God's sovereignty. And just because we don't have time, you can see that there are three separate realms that he talks about. The first one is the realm of creation or the domain of creation. God is the only one who holds creation in his hands. He stands alone. He is the creator. He, is, he stands apart from creation. No one is able to give him advice or give him any kind of consultancy. So in verse 13 and 14, who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? So he is sovereign over creation. He stands apart from creation. Secondly, he is sovereign over history, over all the flow of time and the goings on of the world from eternity past to the end. Verse 23, the nations are like a drop uh, in the bucket for him. You know, he brings princes to nothing and he makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. He is in sovereign control of all history and politics. That's a message that, you know, some, we need to hear. We cannot put our trust in politicians, but we put our trust in God, who ultimately rules over all history and politics. So we do not have to be afraid when people in power are opposed against us. 
or opposed to us. At the same time, we should not take undue comfort in the fact that someone says that he will help us because we cannot depend on those people. But ultimately, we can pray to God because he is sovereign over history and politics. And lastly, he is sovereign over the realm of religion and worship. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? See, men want to bring God down to their level. To make the one who stands apart, to make the incomparable one, one of us. So what do they do? Verse 19 and 20, an idol. It's actually, you know, it's, it's an exclamation, right? Uh, an idol, a craftsman casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it, cast for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. See, Isaiah is laughing uh, at the ridiculousness of idol worship. Now, I grew up, uh, or at least I spent a lot of time in a context where there was idolatry. Idol worship uh, was everywhere. And I would ask people, you know, like, you know, even, even according to your holy books, uh, God is supposed to be all-powerful, so then why do you have an idol? Why do you have an image? They say, well, because then we can perceive and appreciate God. It gives us something to focus our mind on. And God forbids in the Ten Commandments. He said, precisely for this reason, you shall not make an image. Because he does not want us to bring him down to our level. But beyond that, there's a ridiculousness that is associated with idolatry. And that's what, uh, that's what uh, Isaiah is saying. You, you invest a lot of your brain power in, and, and choose good materials to cast an image of a god. And then what do you have to do? He, the, the craftsman has to be skillful because if you don't do it well, uh, the idol is very heavy. It will fall down. So he has to invest uh, his, his brain power and energy in creating a structure that stabilizes God. Because otherwise, that idol will rot or it will fall down from its pedestal. And so Isaiah asks, what is that? So he's sovereign over all creation, over all time and history, and over all religion. He's the only one who is worthy to be worshipped. If he has the desire, therefore, to grant you comfort, does he lack the ability to do so? And the answer is a resounding no. So there's the desire, and then there's the ability. But then there's perspective. Now that you have the information, what will you do about it? How does it affect your reality? How does it affect your situation in the here and now? See, what do, what do the people of Israel say? Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? You know, Israel is saying, and, and it, is a, it is a present continuous, why do you say? They are continuously saying, what do they say? The Lord doesn't care about us. He doesn't even see us. And it says, my right is disregarded by my my God, the word there for right is justice. So basically what they're saying is, the Lord is not fair. He's unjust. My justice is disregarded by my God. And if you think that attitude is tied to the exile, that is not, it, you see that throughout scriptures. In some of the Psalms, you know, it's a common lament. Psalm 13 and verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? There is this uh, common experience in the people of God that God doesn't care about us. In fact, when we say God is not fair, it strikes at the very root of God's character. That accusation. Psalm 89 and verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. So if you say God is unjust, you're basically saying 
you have made a false representation of your character. Now, God is merciful. That's why he has allowed the Psalms to be written and kept in our holy book. But he wants us to see that he sympathizes. It is understandable, but it's also unrealistic. This, this accusation that God is unjust, that God does not see his people. That's why Isaiah recaps in verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. They need to be reminded again and again. He sees them. He knows everything they go through. And he doesn't get tired. You know, parents get tired of caring and running after their children. But God doesn't get tired of that. Not only that, he has an excess of energy to give. Verse 29 and 30. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. That is, even the strongest and the most uh, vital or virile of human beings will get tired. But those who depend on the Lord, he gives them strength and power from his inexhaustible reserve of energy. So what will it take to get the strength? How do we move from constant complaining to basking in the Lord's strength? And you have to understand, the people are in exile. They have not been rescued. So whatever the answer is, it cannot depend on their present situation. You know, uh, in today's world, there is a young, young people, especially, use a word called a cope. Have you heard of this? Like cope, C-O-P-E, cope, you know, coping. You're just coping. You know, it's, it's, it's a short uh, form of the, 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 the concept of coping mechanism, okay? That people in times of trouble try to cope with it try to live with it. And so they find some comfort in something just to take their mind off it. And so it becomes a ma it, it, you know, sometimes young people make fun of other young people saying that you're just coping, you cope. And for many of us, the word of God and the plans and purpose of God are coping mechanism. That is, we want to distract ourselves from what we think are our problems and instead focus on something else that at least for some, some period of time takes our attention away from the problems that we have. But Isaiah doesn't want them to cope. He wants them to understand and have a perspective on what they are going through. Verse 31, it says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They, they who wait for the Lord. The word for wait is the same word as hope. They who hope in the Lord. They who put their trust in the Lord and patiently wait for his promises to be fulfilled. They are the ones whose strength is renewed. It is in that waiting that, that your strength is renewed. Not in the accomplishment of the promises. Because if that is the case, then why do you have to believe in anything? Once you get something, you can always be strengthened. But what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. It is in the waiting that we receive our strength. What is it waiting for? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. It is waiting for God to work on our behalf. And in meanwhile, 
He will strengthen us to live a holy life pleasing to him. It is to live a Christian life. It is to wait for comfort that will relieve us of the guilt and shame of sin. But in the present, it will enable us to live with God and live for God. It is to wait for the return of the Lord for his justice and for his vindication. But while we are waiting, to continue to be strengthened and live out holy lives. How do we wait like that? How do we get strength like that? How do we untie ourselves from a reality that makes us tense and disappointed by things that we cannot even control and in many ways doesn't even matter and instead wait on the Lord for his comfort? That's why you know Isaiah says, uh, you shall mount up with wings like eagles. You know, this is a very famous verse. You have to understand what it is saying. You know, in many passages in the Bible, it talks of uh, us going rescued from a situation uh, on eagles' wings. Okay, that's the children of Israel in the Exodus. There's a passage which talks about that. This is not talking about that. It says, you shall mount up on wings, not on eagles' wings. What does it say? You shall mount up on wings like eagles. Not Some eagle is not going to come and take you and rescue you away from your situation. But instead, you shall mount up like an eagle. What does an eagle have? An eagle has perspective. An eagle is untethered to the ground. It soars in the sky. And it looks down on the world. And when it is in flight, you know, eagles are, they're very strong birds, but they're not, uh, you know, they're not immune to, to being hunted or being killed while on the ground. But while they're in the air, what do they have? They have perspective. They have freedom. They have comfort. They have confidence. It's like us, you know, the first time we go, I don't know if you can even remember, the first time you went in an aircraft. Now, one thing with human beings, we get so jaded by miracles. You know, a few times uh, for work, I've had the uh, opportunity to go in business class. It's great, you know, like I, I'm like a, a kid who got a toy, right? I'm a, like I'm sitting in a metal box flying you know, 35,000 feet above the air, and I have more luxury than at home. You know, I extend my legs, you know, I play with the remote, it, the seat goes back and forth. Uh, you know, people are there to like, they come every five minutes, ask, what do you want, all that. Um, you know, and then, but whenever I go, I used to fly, um, you know, um, I once flew a route to like London from Toronto. There are people, you know, people who have done this so many times. They get into business class, they put their bags up, they go straight into one of the washrooms, they, they change into pajamas, and then come, they extend their bed, put the blanket, and sleep. It's like being here done that, right? That's what human beings like. We are so jaded. We get so jaded that we don't even appreciate the many miracles that happen all around us. But think of the first time you went in an aircraft. You look down from the window, what did you see? All these tiny specks going around, you know, going about their day. You flew over the 401, you saw all the cars that are just waiting. And you think to yourself, you know, I, I am one of those people in those cars which are barely moving. But when you are in the air, you are above them. You have perspective. That's all it is. A bunch of tiny boxes packed from one end to the other. God wants us to have perspective not be tied to the things of this world. But when we have that perspective, that he has the desire to comfort us, he has the ability to comfort us. Therefore, we shall wait for him. Then we shall 
be renewed in our strength? Then can we confidently live our lives without exhaustion, without any lack of energy? And not only that, we can comfort others with the energy that God gives us. We can be a source of comfort to those around us. That's why Paul says, and this is our prayer for all of us, in verse 16 and 17 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your grace and your message of comfort to us, O Lord. Uh, so many times we are so caught up in the day-to-day -day that uh, we uh, become convinced that um, our reality is tied to the things of this world, the things that will fade away and will wither. We know that. We have the knowledge. But the question before us today is, will we have the faith to believe that promise and to act on it? Can we live like those who are confident that God's word is true, that his promises will surely be done? And if that is the case, can we live with the perspective that all the good things that are promised to us have already been accomplished in the cross of Christ? And as we await his coming, may we be comforted knowing that you still listen to us, you care for us, that every situation we go through is for our learning and for our maturing, that no matter what the world does to us, our security and our eternal purpose and home is with you. So may we be strengthened in your comfort and may we look upon those who are struggling and who need strength and, and comfort a lot. And may we be those who are able to provide them that comfort just like God himself gives us all his comfort. To that end, we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.